Hey, Rich. Hey, Martin. Nice to see you. Yeah, we just before we started, you um, you asked me like the frame of what the conversation we're having. Yeah. And I would love that at the end of this chat, that you know, as a as a bill, you know, as as bought into, let's go, or kind of know a little bit more why I have bought into it, and also bought into your to what you want to do and the type of people who you're trying to empower. Hmm. So I'd, I'd love to think at the end of it, I'll, I'll know a little bit more about that. Hmm. Yeah, so I had, right. a, I had a, I had a first question yeah. that I wanted to get started with. And the question is, can you remember some moment in your childhood that, you know, gave you the kind of steer into what you do today? Was there any kind of like major milestone hmm. or experience you went you know, thinking of it, that's exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Um, I don't know if it's a moment, um, but but I think that my childhood has a massive impact on what I do now. Okay. And, you know, I'm a church kid and okay. my parents are very, very deeply involved. And we were very deeply as a family involved in the community. Um, and that meant lots of like, I mean, I guess there's all sorts of sides to that, but like, let's just take the kind of functional side, the the side that is like, you know, putting the chairs out so that there's, so that to gather people together, making yeah. sure that, that um, you're doing your share of like the rotor to make sure that there's tea served, to make sure that there's, yeah. you know, like taking it in turns and hosting different families at different houses to kind of ease the pressure, like big trips away um yeah so it was quite a kind of a relatively small village a couple of thousand people well a relatively i don't know a couple of thousand people in the village and the and a lot of stuff centered certainly in my world a lot of stuff and centered around the church and the church community and then as i grew that kind of changed i left home at 16 and then was immediately going wow i now live on my own renting a room in in a in an elderly lady's house um near because i had an apprenticeship and i just had this massive gap where i was like hey i need a group i need to be part of a group yeah, and right. i think this this sense of this sense of identity as group has been there like that's something that's been in our family and is in our family history we have like i have a lot of um uh a lot of like vicars or 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 kind of pastors in my family um background right. like a couple of my uncles uh, my grandfather so it, it's like uh those kind of energies those energies to gather have been like in my blood mm -hmm. i would say from from a kid sure. and i think you know there's probably other stuff we could go to but i think that would be the place that i how i make sense of mm -hmm. what i do now in that context it's kind of and you know i've seen groups um work really beautifully and create a kind of energy that you just can't get another way and i've seen groups go badly wrong and and that you know i think church communities are also a great example of that where things go really badly wrong mm. and of course you know there's all sorts of things that can go wrong but let's just say the energy of the group can go really wrong um and and i think anything where there's a kind of more i mean essentially anything where you're gathering for a purpose that is where things can go wrong or, or like in a way if if you if there's not a thing you're gathering around it, it kind of doesn't matter like friendships can go wrong and you kind of part ways yeah. but like endeavors like things that you want to do together like commitments that there's something different there right so i mean it sounds like you got a very you know you got a very early introduction to the skills of hosting people mm. and is there any that you think has carried through to how you you walk into a room these days to host a conversation? Uh, I don't know about that. I think there's a lot of water under the bridge since since that. Like okay. I'm talking like I guess when I was imagining it, I'm talking like seven, six, seven, eight, like these kind of ages. Yeah, okay. Like there's a lot of water under the bridge. There's a lot of things I've learned, things I've seen. I would say that is more like the home of my uh, 
there is a part of me that feels safe and curious in groups and i think that right. definitely you know that's like been in me the whole time and then i've been you know i've then been part of lots of different groups and you know work mm. groups projects like you know lots of different stuff so i think it all kind of yeah. is there but maybe there's something in the center that says groups are the home of something special that we don't fully understand but we we do we can get to it and that i think yeah, is right. with me you know i wouldn't underestimate the the power of say, of being able to feel safe and curious mm. in groups mm. i mean that's a i'd say that's a superpower mm. to have been able to bring through the years so maybe a lot of water under the bridge but i think they're pretty strong foundations and that yeah um i don't think ever not everyone can do, can feel safe and they feel vulnerable mm. and so i think that's a yeah for me that's a it's a, a that's a really interesting point about your your background and um, mm. so how did you go from an apprenticeship to to design thinking well it so was big leaps so couldn't be so more I, different right yeah so i spent eight years uh doing basically research science in an oil company in bp and i was uh an apprentice i worked in loads of different departments i became kind of something like a problem solving chemist where there okay. would be a problem in an engine oil and they would send us a sample and we would do loads of different tests and we were basically trying to figure out what had gone wrong like what happened Got that it. this engine failed or what happened that there was uh i know lots of um uh lots of deposits in the engine that meant it was kind of not working efficiently yeah. anymore but what was happening in the oil and what might have happened in the engine so we did that kind of problem solving stuff and then i kind of entered more like a product ownership role from a technical point of view for marine engine oils so this is like engine oils that go in the huge tankers like two stroke engine oils there's a yeah. an the bet the at the time the biggest selling engine oil in the whole world was called clo 50m and uh, clo 50m and that's like a bp uh engine oil product and it's anyway that's just shipping basically so i was in bp marine and then um i was b a bit bored of of my job and a bit disillusioned with what where my career was going so i yeah. almost did a master's degree in international development and I basically went to my boss and said, I'm quitting to do a master's degree in international development. He said, no, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. What can we do to kind of keep you engaged? Like, hey, I know you're a bit bored. There's fun yeah. stuff we can send you on. And they sent me on a project with a company called What If. And it was a project about the future of low carbon, the low, a low carbon future. And how, what do we need to do now to move towards a low carbon future? And yeah. then I got involved in a project that was kind of like an, a strategy project about redesigning where we invest R and D across the whole group uh, with, again, this is me. I'm like 23 and I'm mm. working with like people like my, it's like I'm working in a small team with my boss's boss and then yeah. their peers. And so I was like in these kind of quite exciting projects. And basically the, the what if one, I just was like, I didn't even know that was a job. And so I just um, just basically hounded them until they gave me a job. And uh, so, so it was a really big leap. It's like a job that's really about marketing. Um, it is design thinking, but it's not what if wasn't really like at that point wasn't so product centered design thinking and more like okay. marketing centered or offer centered. It's like creating brands, creating propositions creating yeah. um uh like yeah so you know it, it was it's design thinking but it wasn't from that very like designer perspective it was from more like most people there were like had been a marketing director or had been a strategy director or mm. is those kind of thinkers and so then i spent like eight years first of all being like completely lost like i don't understand it. it's a concept it's very conceptual very different from what i'd done before lots of ethnography so lots of being out and about sitting mm. in people's houses talking to them about what they care about trying to connect that to biscuits um and like you know it was it was like lots of out and about with people um and i just absolutely thrived in it really and even though i didn't have a background in it it was it fitted me like mm. i felt like oh i fit here 
like the the ways I am in the world are appropriate and useful round here. Whereas at BP, I was always a bit of a, I was always a bit of a, you know, I found it hard to do things that were mundane. I just, I don't have that in my bones. I, I just, I'm quite smart, mm. but I'm not very, I'm not very um, methodical like at all. And so at what if this kind of, it opened up the idea that that could be a power rather than a weakness that I had to constantly work on. And mm. that, you know, and then eventually that's eight years and I lived in China for a year in 2011, lived in South Korea, but like for four months, lived maybe is a bit strong, did a project in South Korea for four months, but did loads. I mean, poor, poor, uh, poor environmental degradation because I was on a plane a lot in like 2009, mm. 2010. I was like, I, I think I was young. I was single. They were like, we have a project in Brazil next week. Who wants to go? And I was like, yes, please. Bring it on. I was, yeah, yeah. So I was kind of like jetting all over the world, seeing lots of different cultures, being with lots of different people. And again, you go to Sao Paulo and everyone talks about business trips. Like, oh, business trips are boring because you're just in a hotel. No, we're like in people's houses talking to them about deodorant and talking to them about how they wash talking to them about you know like um uh nutrition and what they care about and how they make nutritional trade-offs with their kids and what convenience right. means and what's so we were talking about in a way i just spent like ages really deeply talking to people about things that matter to them and like then and then and then trying to make sense of that and say well what does that mean for these you know what does that mean for um payment payment technology what does that mean for like credit cards what does that mean for soft drinks okay so it, very mm. peculiar mm. life and and what if what if was an incredibly potent culture it was very group very frank very open very human um, yeah, very dynamic, a bit irreverent, uh, challenging, um, a little elitist. Um, but but there was lots of, you know, there was lots of energy there and lots of sense of, I would say, the a purposefulness to being together. Like, we're what if we're doing this thing. It's different from what other people are doing. It's not just, mm. you know, it's it's it's. Um, it's alive. It felt very alive. And I think that aliveness is again, a thing that they're in that experience. Like, I don't think everyone has this experience, but when you taste that at work, that really deep sense of aliveness, like we're all okay being us and our contributions can together create something magnificent. Mm. That is a really, again, it's, it's like, a, it's kind of addictive because you start to realize that you don't even have to be that clever if you're part of those kind of groups where things sure. really happen, you, you bring what you bring and other people cover your blind spots and together something magical happens. Um, mm. So, the, but you know, at some point in time, you kind of grew out of that and dared to go on your own. Yeah. And in fact, I would say I took a year too long. So I came back from China in 2012 and was very sure that I needed to break away. They gave me, they actually did a smart thing they gave me a job looking after or like 10 percent of my job looking after the social innovation foundation which is where we gave like 200 grand's worth of free consulting to like high potential social entrepreneurs okay. and i basically like led that process through a year and it's obviously super it was like i was super motivated by it, it was like galvanizing lots of people in the organization yeah. something i really cared about so i did that anyway that kind of finished and then i just got to a point where i was like no i do actually need to go and then it took me another six months to have the courage and a few key people who just gave me gave me the encouragement i needed to take the plunge and then 2013 the way it actually worked is i bought a house um picked up my keys and then handed my notice in because basically you need a job to get a mortgage but once you have yeah, a mortgage yeah, yeah. you're like i don't need a job anymore and yeah. i got a house that i could rent some some rooms out for so i could live like i was i could live really small and that's what was made it safe for me to do to just go okay let's go let's okay. let's do this and then so, it was um so was let's go the beginning or was that something that came in the middle so first it was just rich rd watkins consulting limited right 
and then and then I was just doing anything that came my way. Um, I did a rebrand for a ethical mining standard called Fair okay. Mind. Um, I did I did a lot of work with Cancer Research UK on like well I did a huge project on understanding death and dying and grieving and how that relates to giving, which is quite a tender link, right? Clearly, it's very important. Yeah. That's why people give money to cancer charities. But you 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 got to be very careful with that link and like how do you how do you hold that link and what is it what are people feeling that means that that link is a useful grounded link yeah. you know how do you do that well basically how do you not take advantage of people in their grief but how do you maximize the income for cancer research uk given so many people do it in response to grief so that we did like a big research project lots of talking to people about death and dying but then also did a big project about middle-aged men who are wealthy and how do you get their money? Cause they give bigger donations, yeah. but less frequent donations than women. And so, so I did loads yeah. of a kind of whole bunch of work with cancer research UK on innovation, fundraising, innovation did, um, but then was freelancing with other organizations, uh, a, an organization that my, probably my main mentor created business now business four zero who are like a kind of like a, uh, they work at the inter it, they would say they would talk about purpose but they really work at the interface of like not just like purpose statements but like how does how do you generate purposefulness in a whole organization and that's about sure. coherence at the top but it's also about how you take that energy through an organization so how do you link together purpose strategy values like uh, goals how do you link it all so that it really makes sense together and it kind of does something yeah. to people's guts so I, I did a bunch of work with them and then i've got another friend ex what if friend who runs a really cool agency called propeller fish who at that time were based in asia and i did a, some projects with grameen foundation in the philippines creating a development program for coconut farmers um that's uh that was really a collaboration process. It was about bringing different people together. And we were asking the question, like, how do we generate energy in these five different, you know, the national university, the mm. coconut authority, the NGO, the, uni like, a, like a research program that was done by some American um, business. How do you bring all of that together to basically help coconut farmers become more resilient, which turns out is quite hard because... Yeah coconut farming is is difficult is is, is not lucrative so i did yeah, all I mean, these different you, things yeah i mean if you're in some ways you're quite lucky that you've had such a a disparity of of um opportunities from from grief to deodorants all the way through to oil um yeah but you know it all it all came together at some stage and either the card or the help or the team check came for us. I'm not sure which, but, but no, the the model. So two, so this is yeah. 2013. Then I spent two a couple of years floating around, and then I had this idea. I was doing these collaborative art projects at the time, like bringing artists right. together to work on each other's work. We did a process called the Airmail Project, which was like 16 artists in 16 countries, like posting work to each other, and then working on each other's work. So I've got this other yeah. strand and I was trying to figure out like, what am I like? I'm working with Aviva, a massive insurance company, the Grameen Foundation doing these art projects, like what? And then I, I kind of found it was 2016. I found this sense of like, oh, maybe it's collaboration. And I also had the sense that I didn't want to do innovation stuff anymore. Like that was, didn't interest me. And I was much more interested in something else, but I didn't really know what. And then I kind of came to this idea of collaboration. And that was like early 2016. Then the summer, all my projects got cancelled. I was working as an independent, like a freelancer with Business 4.0. Yeah. And they had like a couple of things got delayed, but they also hired a bunch of permanent people. And, and so basically I didn't have, I'd been working with them pretty closely. And then I just didn't have much work. And so I got, uh, <laughs> it's a bit random. I had a Turkish uh, artist staying with me and an old friend from Shanghai who's a, design director and we together created a 30 foot mural in my garden and um this process was like i had the time for it which was really weird because i'm normally quite busy um or normally rushing around and i had a lot of time and a lot of space 
and I had the intention, like around collaboration, and the Grameen Foundation project, they'd been asking me to train them in facilitation, and I found that all very weird and didn't know what to do. And then I sort of, something arrived, which was like a sense that there could be a coherent way to think about what facilitation was. And that is, I've got a little document where it, can that's began to be say like, there are different like modes or domains mm. in which we facilitate so facilitation stops being a thing like like oh i'm a facilitator and starts being these yeah. set of things like sometimes i'm inspiring people and sometimes i'm instructing people and sometimes i'm like listening to people and sometimes so these different like modes of facilitation started to become clear and that those five modes became the let's go model um and again, there's a few, I've got a few iterations of that, like in documents. And then basically my process was, I just went, this feels good, like, like deeply good. Something about this feels deeply good. And then I just started going and going, who do I know? I, I, I know a psychotherapist. So who's also a philosopher. So I took him out and said, what do you think of this? Then I, I know, um, like loads of people from what if really were really helpful. I just went to them and said, is this different? Is this helpful? And then uh, a psychologist. And then I'd recently met um, uh, like um, I had a friend who worked in sports and he put me in touch with an ex premier league manager who agreed to meet me. And so I basically just went and met loads of people and went, I've got this way of thinking about, because initially it was facilitation but as soon as it landed into something it became very clear that it was much different from just facilitation it could be used in a facilitation context but it could also be used to think about a whole project and mm. that's in the end how i started to think about what is collaboration it's and i my language would be getting things done in groups creating energy in groups that allows things yeah. to happen okay and um... So when you were putting the let's go model together, what was the, what was the, do you think was the one word that kind of brought it, that was your anchor? Was it really collaboration or was it something else? At the time, I mean, I literally last night was looking through a bunch of emails and I used to talk about, um, I used to talk about it like creative collaboration is what I would talk about it as initially. Mm -hmm. I would say it's what happens when we're creative together doing um uh so i was like literally and then i've got loads of emails of me saying i have a new leadership model for creative collaboration and can yeah. i talk to you about it that was sort of my language for it at that time um but i and so yeah I, it was collaboration the word um it started facilitation then it kind of became collaboration but i think actually if i'm honest it's because collaboration had already been an anchor for me. I'd felt lost. I didn't know what I was for. I was doing all these different projects, but I didn't feel coherent. I didn't feel clear. I didn't know what right. kind of opportunities to go for. And then when I went, ah, I feel energized by collaboration. That is the process, not the out, not the project. Like I'm not, I don't right. mind whether we're doing this or that or this. I'm interested in the yeah. group process. And as soon as I kind of, got to that the word i had for that was collaboration and so in the end i i brought the word collaboration in and then that is from that place and and facilitation is sort of how i got to this model um but that's like yeah two this is like august september 2016 and i will say this like it was a time of and i've literally got an email that i wrote to business four zero basically saying I don't want any more projects or I don't want any more big projects because I'm going to orientate around this and I'm going to build. Mm. And what became really clear at that point is that I couldn't orientate it around it on my own. It would be incongruent. So I recruited three people. So I already had an assistant um, and I recruited a new assistant. Like I had an assistant who was leaving. So I recruited a new assistant and two consultants um people that i knew people who i had a sense could be powerful at developing the work yeah and yeah that was so so that's what happened in 2016 and that's well before the cards or the team check or anything like that and i didn't really know what it was for i just knew that this model was powerful and it, a way of thinking mm. um so can i ask you a question because i think it, there's loads of people including me that will, will value the answer 
Um, you know, how does it feel when something starts to feel coherent? Because coherence for, for you turned into belief because you have to believe a fair amount to to hire someone. It's like the duty yeah. of care to hiring your first employee. Yeah, right. And I, it, it, it lies, it feels heavy on my chest. Yeah, it, right. It, like it was a, it was a very kind do, of. Do you know it? Brave it, move. It. Do you know I'm someone who's actually very anxious. So if I think about most of what I've done in my life, I get very anxious. I was very anxious before leaving. What if? I'm like I was very anxious. But then what happens is in my life, there have been moments where anxiety just falls away. So when I got this job at BP, age 16, I wasn't anxious. I was like, this is right. This is the move. This is yeah. what I need to do now. And and what I spend a lot of time in between those moments, racking my brains, trying to persuade myself to be comfortable with things when I'm not. But when I am, like I'm basically brave occasionally and and mostly not brave, actually. And occasionally I'm very right. brave. And and that was one of the moments of deep, bre like bravery, but not bravery like I'm trying to be brave, not like feel the fear and do it anyway, not that kind of yeah. thing. When I feel the fear, I don't do anything. I just am scared. But there's moments where I don't feel any fear. There's a kind of clarity that this is the yeah. right thing for me to do right now. And the only thing that I can do right now and what I must do, and I will do it at any cost and I will suffer for it. Yeah. Well, that was that's the reason why I chose the word belief because your coherence seems to gel into belief that gives you the f feeling of what's next and what's possible. I just felt that's like it. this is a good thing and the world needs it and I need to talk about it. And also, you know, I just spent two years very uncertain about what my role in the world was. Like it looked mm -hmm. kind of, I don't know, when I tell the story, it sounds impressive. Like Cancer is such UK, this, this, this. It didn't feel like that. It felt fragmented. It felt, um, I felt very uncertain. If people said, what are you for? Like, what do you do? What can you help me with? I would say things like, I'm like good at innovation yeah. or I can help you. I didn't have a deep sense of what I was for in the world. And this offered me something. So, and, and, and again, that, that, so just, a, it was a deep, and again, I, I would use, I mean, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think whether it's, but it is belief. Um, but from a let's go model point of view, it's also because there seems to be some kind of structure. <laughs> there seems to be right. a road for progress. There seems to be a possibility of involving other people in it. There seems to be a connection that I could make. And that what was mm. clear is sometimes when I spoke to people, they would say, oh, yeah, everyone, I mean, a model, everyone's got a model. And some people's eyes just went, whoa, that is something you have there. And there was enough people like that. I, I, I remember... I got introduced, I got a very dear friend who's been an incredible support through this whole process called Simon Hildrew. And he used to work at The Guardian. And he introduced me to someone at The Guardian who were trying to figure out how to make The Guardian more collaborative, the newspaper um, or newspaper website, whatever. Yeah. The, and I met this guy there and he just went, wow, we've been asking ourselves about collaboration and we've got nothing. We've just been, our thinking is empty compared to this. Right. So so then I that gave me such a sense of, wow, right. I was convinced that The Guardian was going to be a huge client, blah, blah. They never paid for anything. They had a huge reorganization. He left to do something different. The guy who replaced him sort of didn't really care so much. Yeah. It completely dissolved. But the moment of encouragement that I got there was so vivid. I was like, these are really smart people have been thinking about collaboration a lot. And they looked at it and went, yeah. that's that is actually a thing that is true. And that's the kind of um when i've shown you know the let's go model when it resonates with people like that that's what it seems to do and and you know it's like i walked into so this is fast forward a bit right we got an introduction to hsbc and i walked in the door as like a complete unknown they were like oh we're doing something about collaboration and i just took it through them and the, the there was a senior director in the room and he was just like we've got a thing next week like a, a test out next week I want you to come and deliver a session in the test out because this, this seems like yeah. something. So, and then we tested it and then everyone went, there's something let's put it in the program. And then before we knew it, we were in like the global leadership development program. And that's like kind of not really from, that's just because the work, 
that's not really because I'm partic- I'm not even particularly good at selling anything, but the it 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 lands. And I think that gave again, but I don't think I could have done that if I just I think very early on I was very I first of all I was worried that it was a model that already exists and I didn't know about it. Secondly, I was worried that it wasn't new enough for other people or that they wouldn't get it. Thirdly, that it just felt too simple. And I just wasn't sure if something so simple could be, you could, mm. and then I got worried that people were going to steal it. Like I would share it with someone, they would steal it and then I wouldn't have it anymore. Or they would do it better than me. So I had all these anxieties yeah. about it, but I did have a deep sense that it was a good thing um, and that I needed to do it with other people. I had that as well. Okay. So, you know, in, in order in order to land it further, I assume that's how the cards came into existence. And should I show you? Should I show you again. what it what it looked like in the yeah. first? Should I show you that? It's kind of fun, sure. isn't it? Yeah. Um. So let's go. Let's start right at the start. So this is. So this is the first document. This is August the ninth, two thousand and sixteen. Yeah. And it basically says. Uh. This is something different. That's a completely different model that I really like. Uh, this says these are the modes. So mode, holding space, teaching or informing, participating, structuring or directing, moving on, adding momentum, lightning, energizing, motivating and inspiring. Yep. Okay. What's the outcome that you're looking for? They're different. What's How do you stand? What kind of language do you use? What is it not? And then something here, right? This is like this incomplete thing was like it was just this idea now this all revolved right so this means this has become care holding space is care teaching or informing is actually now it's not really about that because um it's about progress uh um participating is about involvement structuring um this also included some progress in it directing moving on adding momentum right this moving on and adding momentum has gone over here to progress the teaching and informing kind of is back over here with structure. So you've got structure and then you've got belief. And so that, but this idea that you could literally ask the question, like what's the mode? What are you trying to do? How do you stand? What kind of things do you say? And then that became, this is the first prototype, right? Um, And then there's loads of blah, 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 blah. But basically, it becomes this you know um yeah and this is so this is already this is really so that's august the 16th this is by the i'm sharing this like mid mid august so really it came together really quickly it didn't involve lots and lots of changing of words and things like that it did involve a bit and i there's a few people to to name check there's a guy called nathan who i'd been working with at aviva who's an hr director there um Mm -hmm. uh, a guy called um ben um Ben Stevens, who was a designer from What If, I sat, he was asked, we were going to do another project together. And I was like, oh, we're doing this other project, by the way, this. Um, and actually, I realized that one of the first people I showed it to was a guy called um, Jonathan, who I'd worked with at Propellerfish, another design thinking guy. So I'd shared it with, and then Cleo, who you met on the um, yep. the last facilitator okay. training. So she was very, very early as well. And in fact, she gave me the first opportunity to share it with any group with the Forward Institute, which had really just founded then. Um, but this is sort of, again, this is sort of, we had this sense of things. Yeah. And then, um, and they were at that point called domains, the domain of scope, rules, norms, explanations, roles, timing, process, mm-hmm. activities, and different outcomes. I feel clear. Right, belief. I feel confident. Belief. Um, I feel clear structure. I feel heard and respected. Involvement. I feel momentum. Progress. I feel bonded. The domain of noticing people, human contact, energy, getting mm-hmm. to commitment. Blah blah blah. So this is like, this is what it looked like until I did the design work on it, which is when I went to Cape Town. And so this is all like, so this is all August, September, October. People joined in January. Uh, people joined in so Rachel joined straight away Dan joined I think around October November then um, once we had the model the the big and then Chris joined in um, who you was also on the last facilitator training which is funny just because he was so embedded at the start but he joined in January Um, so then 
and then I had a project with um, Sanofi and then it went quite well. Like they really liked the model, but we were doing this big activity where um, we were creating a, a like huge sculpture from the model. We were getting people to pick the colors that related to what they thought the organization needed. And we were trying to turn it into a big like fine art sculpture. And actually the first contact with them was about, can you create a fine art sculpture for us? And um, because I've been doing all these art projects and I was like, yeah, but can I smuggle this thing in? And they were like, yeah, sure. Anyway, that thing went really well. The fine art sculpture went not so well. Everyone got super glue on their hands, <laughs> but nothing good happened from it. And um, but then in the aftermath of that, we were like, OK, we got to do something for them. And in fact, Alexander, who's also a trained Let's Go facilitator, um, he said to me, you should do a workshop in a box. And we'd already had this idea okay. of the cards. We'd already had the idea that maybe that was a useful thing. And so the cards, basically, we accelerated them to development to try and appease the fact that our project hadn't gone super well. And then that's the beta pack of cards that then became a Kickstarter project that then, you know, and that was version one and we're now on version seven. So, th and that in the early, early days, that's just what became, what was really good about having a team is my in a way, I could really see the Let's Go model. I could see that just from these five words, everything's possible. But most people who hadn't got a deep, deep practice in groups, or even if they had, they just hadn't ever thought about it like that. They, they needed the next layer down. They needed like more distinctions. Like, what do you mean by belief? Well, we mean a vision of the future. We mean a sense mm -hmm. that it's worthwhile. We mean a contextual sense that it's, it's the right thing to do now. So we needed these distinctions. And that's what the cards, in a way, mm -hmm. they the cards created the distinctions. Because without the cards, I just had like a lot of a big word salad. And the cards forced it down a road where you could go, no, no, no. This is a thing that could be distinguished. Okay. So, I mean, that sounds like a, a pivotal moment, right? It's like a... The cards. On the corner. Yeah. They they um, they um symbolize, you know, the sense of increased coherence. Mm. It, um, and it sounds like the way that you describe it, you're, you're indebted to a number of people. Yeah. Because it the coherence went of the core without their feedback a hundred percent i suppose the coherence happened in dialogue like it didn't happen like in my yeah, mind right. the model and that's if you think about the, the approach they're like, like i've i could talk to you about the theoretical underpinnings but they kind of are only really the dots that joined up that make sense looking back yeah the theoretical underpinnings yeah. it didn't come from theoretical underpinnings it came and then it got built and strengthened in conversations and i basically yeah. just it, like think of my practice my practice is an ethnographer and in in the design thinking process you get an idea and then you what we used to call it a hot shop but you basically take it to people and go what do you think of that how could you improve it what holes are there in it what doesn't make sense what don't you like a good example mark vernon who's a good friend of mine now but actually then i barely knew him but i knew that he lived in camberwell which is where i live and he's a philosopher and a psychotherapist and i just thought he seems like a clever chap and i had at this point the model and i had it on a little collaboration on a little business card that i've probably got somewhere and i showed it to him here we go here's literally the business card that i showed him this is when the okay. model the, the design first happened so basically the design work happened with again some people that i'm indebted to in and that happened when i was in cape town and the uh the colors we i literally was borrow getting an airbnb from someone who was the costume designer for the walking dead and she just she so she owned the airbnb in cape town but she was out in wherever they were doing the walking dead i think mexico but i actually honestly don't even know and she just was talking about how her whole approach is rooted in color and i was like oh i've got a color challenge for you what's the color of belief what's the color and i explained the dynamics and she literally we sat for dinner with a color wheel and she just went no, 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 that's not belief. This is belief. No, 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 that's, no, I think care care has to be green. And it, ha it can't, no, not that green. It's the wrong tone. Needs to be warmer or whatever. So she helped pick these colors. In wow. fact, she didn't even help pick them. She picked them with, like, we, we're, it. so, like, there's so yeah, many yeah, elements that are, that are embedded in other people, 
it's like mm. the idea didn't come from my head the idea came from the conversations that i chose to have and and i basically spoke to loads of people and anyway but mark vernon was like i like it i don't like that let's go in the middle Ooh, it doesn't feel good what is that let's go that caused the reflection which was like mm, this is about presence so presence didn't arrive in the middle and i would say if i'm honest i think i neglected presence for like the first two years like i was so obsessed with the 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 the, the bits around yeah. the edge but but presence is what holds the model together and without presence in a way it's just another model of teams and with presence it, it asks a different question but this graphic I mean, that came to me quite clearly because clearly the graphic I had before was clunky, awkward, yeah. the kind of thing you see in a business book, but it was not alive. And it's the aliveness of groups that I think we're trying to talk about, the, the dynamicness. And again, as soon as then you go, they're dynamics, they're not domains. They're not, and again, this is um, in, the, in the spirit of David Bohm, they're not separate, they're distinct. Like their lenses you can look through. And again, an, an early phrase we had for it, we almost called it for a while, the collaboration compass. Um, okay. And then we realized that we just call it the let's go model and that was easier. But but for a while it was an, the collaboration compass. Yeah, there's many, and there's way too many compasses out there these days. And right, I mean, it, you can't move for compasses. Yeah. So what I, I you know, we... we what I wanted to do next with you was I, I wanted to try and disarm you a little bit. Yeah. And I have um I have a set of collaboration cards yeah. for four year olds. Perfect. So um, they're called conversation starters. They're yeah. Yeah, great. And the and I just thought, well, maybe we could use a few of these cards and see how they might um trigger a conversation that we're having. And um I just thought I I try a few and there's a I've got a couple of curveballs and and I just thought you know why not let's see how yeah. we go. So tell me about a time, and I suppose to give this a uh, a bit of kind of of a calendar. To, uh, so it's it's really the last couple of years. Hmm. So let's say it's post and um, post two thousand and twenty. Okay, so that at so that it's... point. I'm now back down from a team of four. I'm back down to two. Yeah. So exactly. two people have left. Yeah. Yeah. And so tell me about a time that, of what made you happy to, in that period to where you are today. So some, to, something to, that made you, me you happy gotta have in, some, in yeah, that period. The, you know, what you're doing could be lonely and without energy is even lonelier so yeah was, when you're I'd locked in a house on your own a moment yeah so yeah, definitely i know exactly the moment so the moment is working with warner brothers discovery or a discovery at that point before the merger i was working with discovery and um in fact a lot of work got cancelled with the pandemic and the good news for them is they sort of had me in mind like hey we'd love to do something with you but we can't work with you this year because our will have our programs are full but then the COVID cancelled all their programs. So they were like, oh, everything's up in the air again. Who? And they asked the question, like, who could work dynamically, globally, online? Let's give Rich a go. Right. And they had a concept called a sprint. And a sprint, I'd been doing training like this. Come in a workshop for a day uh, and we'll get through it. And then people leave slightly bewildered. They leave, like, impressed. They leave, oh, something happened today, but they don't leave with any more, with many more skills. Sure. And they, they basically created a thing called a sprint, which is like four 90 minute sessions. And then in each session, there's a bit of content, but really they're coaching sessions more than training sessions. So obviously you need to give some content to start with, but, but basically then through those programs, like that sprint, which is about the same as a day's worth of content, about a, the day's worth of time, yeah. four 90 minute sessions, about a day, isn't it? I started to see huge shifts in how people could approach the everyday situations that they're faced with. That wasn't there when I was doing my one day sessions. Everything was in the imagination. Like imagine a situation. This was more like, okay, now go and have the conversation. How did it go? Ah, mm. oh, yeah, it didn't really work for that reason. Let's, let's digest that. Let's work with yeah. that. 
What conversations do you need to have now? What's opened up? What's closed down? What are you learning? And it was a group process, about eight people where they could learn off each other. And one of them would come and go, oh my goodness, I had a conversation with my boss and everything's changed. And that gave energy to everyone, even though their experience hadn't been so good or, or whatever. So, yeah. so that moment really got me connected to the power of this because I, I had lost a bit of sense of that, I think, at, the, at that point. Okay. And so when I was doing those sprints and I was very nervous about them, but they were, they went really, really well. And we ended up doing like about, I think about 200 leaders through these kind of sprints. And they, it really changed. And in a pandemic year, when I was having a baby as well, changed a lot. Oh, wow. Okay. So next question. Tell me about what you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> it's funny. Okay, so in 2016, before the Let's Go model arrived, I settled on this idea. I said, or I felt, I had the sense that I wanted to be a cultural voice. And I started saying that to some people, some friends. And some of them said things like, for what? <laughs> <laughs> and some of them said things like, your art projects aren't very interesting. <laughs> and so... Um, and so I remember feeling that very deeply, but not knowing what it meant. I almost did a master's degree at the same time as starting Let's Go and employing people uh, on because I wanted to be a cultural voice. But I didn't know what for and I didn't know how, but it, I had this sense. And so I think probably that's still something like what I want to be when I grow up. And 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 yeah. now it feels more grounded. Now it feels like I you know and there's other model there's other things that i'll do but like i i this is i want to be a voice for some of these ideas oh cool i uh, these are working out really well <laughs> i've got a couple more because uh, i know we're nearing the hour and then um, we, we wanted to kind of stick to the air on this um tell me about something that is hard for you to do and you could do with some help ah uh um lots um uh order order right? order sc scale um i think what well, i feel more clear than ever that i can't do it on my own the let's go thing um yeah i also think i also think it's very there's also a different energy that's created when you talk about yourself because the line between the line between let's call it something like coherent alignment with what is good and uh self promotion bullshit is a blurry line to navigate and and that's yes. not always easy to stand in a place that tries not to be the self promotion bullshit and tries to speak coherently about something that you've seen yeah. so i think i think that that it's some people can see it, the, the the coherence, and some people can't. And I sometimes can't stand in both of the, I get confused. So I think there's something about being part of a, a, I think, getting the let's go. I guess my imagination at the moment, I've had different imaginations through the process. But my imagination at the moment is getting to the let's go facilitator community as a kind of as a kind of space in which more can open up. Um, I... Uh, but yeah, and then and then you know, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of things that need to still need to land into clarity. Um, that's kind of coming actually. Like the, the the we're getting clearer about the purpose. We're getting clearer about the product set, which feels close to complete. Not complete like finished, but complete like sure. good enough for now. And um, yeah, so I think, but but I think I think basically getting getting the stuff known um, feels increasingly like an imperative i've always had it as an imperative but i think i've had it as an imperative that i wasn't confident in like right like i think i ended up playing quite small with some things like i i um and so also encouragement like like this sh should be an hbr article or an, an article yeah. in sloan like mit sloan that is that's the other magazine isn't it like these kind of it should be somewhere like this like how um but but uh, yeah. But that requires some kind of 
like stepping into bigger spaces. Whereas, you know, it's easier for me to say, oh, let me write a blog for uh, a small magazine in the UK. Like that is easier, but actually it there's a moment where the Let's Go stuff needs to be, needs to step onto more ambitious ground. And I think yeah. I, I, again, I want that. I deeply want that. I actually feel more integrated with that than I would have in 2016. I think 2016, I was much closer to the, that I, it was very difficult to separate it from me. Um, mm. But I, so I think all of this is stuff where I need, again, it's both, you know, I, I, I need something. I've talked a long, for a long time about needing like a head of operations who can begin to operate, operationalize things. But I, I think it might be, it might be, um, not that simple i think that feels like a simple answer to what might not be so simple i think i think it might be more dynamic what's needed than that um but yeah okay i had um i had one final question and this question is probably um a tougher one but i thought it would be a really kind of good way to kind of give a you know a final parting gift for us all if you saw someone being bullied during a let's go collaboration session, how do you go about addressing it? Someone being bullied. I might need to know what's happening rather than, because bullied is like a concept, but like what's happening? Are they yeah, being but, shut um, down? So, de so demeaned. demeaned. Ooh. Which it's I think never... is a form of bullying. Right? Yeah, right. Demeaned. Yeah. I mean, I think. Or dismissed. Um, it dismissed is easy. I would just say, "Oh, Sarah, you were talking," like just drawing attention to the person right. who who was. If someone's trying to say something and they get shut down by someone, I would do something like assert what I've already asserted. So in every session, I would already have given the frame that we need to hear from everyone. Mm. So so I would then reattach to that frame and say, "Okay, so we're here to explore this stuff genuinely together, and like we need to put the conversations into the space." Yeah. So let's hear from that and i would just confidently call on them and I, in a way i wouldn't enter the drama i certainly wouldn't like defend them or like i wouldn't get too entangled i would just keep like i would be relatively but i would make sure their voice was heard um yeah, okay and if if i felt like it was deeper than that and again i guess i'm imagining it being on zoom just because so much has been on yeah. zoom if it was off zoom i guess i would um again it's all context like how well do I know that if it's the leader that's doing it? Um, I might, um, a, a big move that I often make where there's someone trying to shut something down, I just say something. So if someone's someone's trying to make a point and someone else is saying that's stupid or I don't agree with that point, I would just go, well, that's really interesting that you two see it like that. What do others think? So I would invite right. the group trying to, to hold it. Yeah. Not someone else, but the group. I'd be like, what do others think? And I would just... And that I learned from the Gestalt stuff that I did, like that I used to always feel, and especially when I'm, and I would also use that if I'm the, if someone comes at me, they'll be like, well, I think this is a waste of time. I'd be like, cool. W w what do others think? Because, and I would basically just trust that. I mean, the thing is, if it is a waste of time, what I'm doing, then we want to know actually, and then we yeah. can do something different. You want to fix, fix it. We or, or like at least a move. Like if everyone thinks it's a waste of time, but if it's just him, I don't know why it's going to him. I probably him, but yeah. if it's just him or her or them, then then inviting the question, like the curiosity, would be the with the approach. It's a bit harder if there's like a particular dynamic. Maybe if I'm aware of it as well, and I'm aware of some of the dynamics, it might be harder or I might feel more entangled. Mm -hmm. But I'm often quite. Um, I, I've I just haven't I mean probably what happens more is 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 those kind of dynamics play out outside of the room in which I can't um yeah well that's much harder connect sure. with but I would yeah. I would just I would I, I'd see myself not as a fixer but like a light shiner like I would mm. shine a light on it and say wow like I mean in in a if I go into other modalities right which is not so much like a let's go session if I go into other facilitation modalities I would maybe mm enter into it like let's explore this dynamic if there's that yeah. agreement but like in yeah, the no, stuff that i do normally mm. no, normally i just make sure i mean in fact i often have the other trouble which is that someone speaking 
too much or taking much, up too much space yeah. and they get a lot of deference so it's someone who is used to grandstanding and they want to grandstand they that's the way that they know how to be yeah. and then again i tend to create structures like i say something yeah. like we're going to hear from everyone just one breath yeah. or something like i do something to constrain it but um so i use structure often yeah. but in that instance so i i guess i i, I could intervene in some sort i wouldn't normally go in like as a rescuer i would normally yeah, shine a light it? on the situation and then yeah. see and then bring other perspectives yeah. to bear in it I, I sort of trust that i sort of have a trust in most groups that they're not looking to um it's not yeah. always true actually but yeah anyway that's my i think that's my answer it's a good answer uh, i mean you know when i when i reflected on this question the first time um maybe it you know it's it's my background but um i went to me being the bully mm. and it's and i was seeing my behavior in someone else and mm. you know for me the one that i i wouldn't say notorious because if i was notorious i would have not gotten another job and it was when i started to be a bit mean to the skeptic mm. now and i'd be like oh, so what do you think so go mm. straight to it or you know i you know i'd nitpick on a particular mm. word or if if they said something i'd bring it up two more times in the day mm. just to kind of you know throw the dagger in and so yeah i think for me uh, as a facilitator we also can be the bully all right i think i'm I'm more likely like the way that I'm dysfunctional is I'm more likely to be a show off. Right. I'm more likely to take up more space than is appropriate. I'm more likely to make it more about my opinions than is appropriate. I'm more likely to do a bit of grandstanding um, right. than I am to, to bully. I think that's, 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 um, but again, I think we've all got out the, I'm not, that's not a, like I use uh, Virginia Satir's defensive stances as a kind of really, and I've built on them slightly, but I basically say the kind of ways that we're defensive, which is when we're not deeply in presence and we're just saying how we see it, where there's blaming, there's posturing, there's um, placating, there's avoiding, and there's uh, dogmatic. And I'm sometimes a bit dogmatic and posturing would be the ones that I'm most... Okay. I don't do a lot of placating. I don't do a lot of avoiding. Sometimes I could do with doing a bit more avoiding. And um, and I don't, in those contexts, I don't do a lot of blaming. I might blame inside, but I don't mm. tend to do that. But those are the, like, but I think it's quite a nice way yeah. of thinking about the, the types. Because I would see all of these, like, bullying. I would see it all as defensive behavior. Like, you bully to defend yourself. Like, it, it's yeah. it's a way of avoiding the difficulty of genuine human contact because that is difficult and and yeah, i would yeah. it's, you know it's it's also usually true some, usually true some form of control yeah 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 and i think you know there's also mm. a power control thing which i actually don't feel like i have a a deep handle on power dynamics as as in i don't have a way to make sense of power dynamics that i feel is really useful like i see power dynamics and i mm. kind of know that they exist and but I haven't found a way yet to really access. I haven't found like a clear way to clean up power dynamics in a way that allows you to distinguish what's going on. Um, but power is super yeah, interesting and always comes up in this stuff. So, I, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we've kind of come to the end of our interview. I suppose, is there is there a question that you hope I would have asked or is there... Has this journey from starting from the very beginning of seven to where we are now, has it been an interesting experience for you? And yeah, I mean, interesting to your listeners. It's been really interesting to me. Like I've um, been, I've got all this about, this is all my notes about like my journey. And like, we've probably touched like two points on it. So, so yeah. there's a lot to say, but like, I think, I mean, maybe one of the conversations that we'd talk or, or one of the things I'd maybe hoped not hoped but one of the things i'd imagine would be a talk about the theoretical underpinnings of the let's go model and i think yeah, right. obviously we've ended up telling more like the story which was a really good conversation but i think there's there probably is a conversation 
whether that's our sort, but there's a mm. thing to say about what's the theoretical underpinnings. And I think that would be interesting. Um, yeah. But I think the, 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 in terms of telling the story, I think it's probably the most coherently yeah. I've told the story and the most clearly I've told the story of, of what the let's go model is. Um, yeah. So I, it feels, I mean, it's felt very good. Nice one. Yeah. I, I, w I probably avoided the, the theory element because for me, this was in a, it, it, this was a, your your story, your conversation, and if we start going into theory, I'd part of me would want to let you know the bits that I know, and I, I know that theory too, and I and I'd probably ask you a question on an element of on dialogue that I resonated with that you haven't mentioned. Yeah, and, right. Yeah, and I, just, and, and, I, and I felt for for what we wanted to do today, I wanted to stay in your world. Yeah, right. I mean, maybe there's another conversation that is a wider group. I mean, it would be really interesting to get a wider group together on theory and like how theory connects to the Let's Go model, because I think that would be a very interesting. And I think that isn't a dialogue. I mean, that's a, yeah, that's I a think dialogue, that's but it's more it's a I yeah. feel it's more like a, there'd be an interesting group to go. Yeah, what do we see and how that resonates? Yeah. Uh, and I think the, the power of that question is um, it's kind of the let's go has kind of gone beyond you now because people make connections to theory that you didn't in consider, the last right? facilitator training you petra um uh cleo like lots of people um um uh sophie in the first session reference theories and approaches that i don't deeply know some i'm more of a generalist i would say like i have traveled very far and wide across theory but i am not actually a theoretical expert on a lot of things right. like i don't if you really push me i don't deeply understand agile like i kind of get it i kind of get it at a very high level but do i deeply understand about how to operationalize agile in a huge organization i don't know i've never worked in Agile. like i don't know so and i think you know these kind of different and, and and i've read a decent amount of books but i'm not like i left home at 16 I'm not a bookie. Like I read books, but yeah. I'm not like a, I'm not academic in that way. I'm conceptual. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's my home. My home is like, talk to people, draw out coherence and see what emerges in conversations with people. Nice. When I see something good, I know that it's good and I can connect it to some theories, but that theoretical conversation would be super valuable that, and I've not had it. Yeah. That's, I think that'd be best as a group discussion for sure a hundred percent thank you very much for the conversation and um good to no see problem. you cheers man